Sin is the thing that man allowed into our existence. It is not of God, it is of Satan. And we're going to be talking about the cost of that today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. This is Quick Study Television, a television program designed to bring you the Bible. Every single day from Genesis 1 and everything in between to Revelation 22. The whole Bible in one year. Today we're focused on Isaiah 22 to 24. And Corey, what do you do? When God uses sarcasm and a man named Shemda. Very good. And God uses sarcasm. Can you believe that? <laughs> I can, actually. Wow. Okay. So what'd you do? We're going to talk about the long list of pairs in Isaiah 24. Long list of pairs. Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. And Ryan is here. Ryan, what's up? Today we're studying an ancient Minoan relic called the Phaestus Disc. Could it be that these people developed the first movable type? Today, you and I are going to be focusing in on Isaiah chapter 22. Now, this uh, chapter of prophecy through Isaiah is really interesting. There is a section where God seems to use sarcasm, which we're going to talk about after. And in the last part of the chapter, uh, Isaiah specifically points out a man in King Hezekiah's court, a part of that court. His name is Shebna. Take a look. In the 1870s, an inscription was discovered in the area of the Silwan tombs within the limits of modern day Jerusalem and facing the ancient city of David. It was removed for preservation and sent to the British Museum, but it wouldn't be until 80 years later that it would gain the attention it deserved. In 1953, it was finally deciphered as an identifying inscription, naming Shebna Yahu and his wife as the occupants of the tomb, and also as a curse against anyone who would later disturb their bodies. The tomb being long disturbed, researchers were more captivated with the name Shebna Yahu, which is the long form of the name Shebna. In the Bible, the prophet Isaiah lectures a Shebna who is an official in King Hezekiah's court for making himself an ornate tomb just outside of Jerusalem. Could this Shebna and the tomb's original owner have been the same man? Based on the dating of the inscription, nearly all archaeologists agree that it is likely. Comparing the inscription with known inscriptions from Hezekiah's reign proved key in solidly placing this tomb at its proper age. Along with the tomb of Shebna, two clay signet seal impressions have been found that are probably his. The first was found in excavations of Lake Kish in the 1960s. Lake Kish was the Judean defensive city that was destroyed by the Assyrians during Hezekiah's, and so also Isaiah and Shebna's, lives. Unfortunately, the seal impression here was damaged. It read, belonging to Shebna, of the king. But what was this Shebna's relationship to the king? Did the seal originally read son or servant? If servant, this could be the very seal impression from Shebna, official of Hezekiah, known to Isaiah the prophet. Luckily, in 2007, another clay seal impression was discovered that matched the seal. The same signet seal had made it. This Shebna was the king's official. The evidence for Shebna's life is compelling. Not only do we have him mentioned by Isaiah, an inscription above a tomb dating to the time of Hezekiah mentions his name, as well as two signet seal impressions. So there we have it, the last half of chapter Isaiah chapter 22, illuminated by history and archaeology. Now, the first part of Isaiah chapter 2, uh, you know, God calls Jerusalem the Valley of Vision. Now, this isn't used anywhere else in the scripture of Jerusalem, and it appears to be a very sarcastic statement by God. Uh, and, and the reason being is throughout the chapter 22, uh, Jerusalem and Judah, they are, they are shown to be completely blind. They're not getting what is going on and what God is trying to say to them. But uh, many historians believe that the uh, Jerusalem being called specifically the Valley of Vision refers to the Valley of Hinnom in which uh, people would try to practice divination so they could see the future. They could peer into the spiritual world. And the irony of this is that their very attempts at trying to see into the spiritual world and into the future have actually made them blind 
mind to truth and to reality. So God uses a little bit of sharp sarcasm here to, to get his message across. Now, chapter 22 is also an indictment of the people of Jerusalem and Judah who seem to be here uh, uh, relying on King Hezekiah's preparation for the Assyrian invasion and not on God's protection. Now, Hezekiah had his priorities straight. He was focused on God, but the people were focused on the wrong thing. Even when God came through with a big miracle, it didn't clue them in to God's greater purpose for them. Death is not a reality of life, but of sin. Earth is not as it was when it was created. You see, the planet was made perfect as well as the universe. But God commanded Adam and Eve, who were responsible as our first parents, not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Doing so would bring sin and would bring death to the earth and the universe. They disobeyed God. And sin entered the world and changed everything. So today, we don't live on the planet that God first created. He moved into this world 2,000 years ago and fully paid for the cost of sin himself. Today, we have choices. Avoid sin and seek God. Give in to sin and do what we want. Now, in the end of time, God will judge the world based on sin. And those who seek after God and come to know him, well, who he is, they'll ask him to come into their lives. They'll ask him to be Lord and avoid judgment. And Isaiah 24 speaks about what will happen to everyone else. Isaiah 24, verses 1 through 13. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts its surface and scatters abroad its inhabitants. And it shall be, as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with his master, as with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the creditor, so with the debtor. The land shall be entirely emptied and utterly plundered, for the Lord has spoken his word. The earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth languish. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, the curse has devoured the earth and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned and few men are left. The new wine fails, the vine languishes, all the merry-hearted sigh. The mirth of the tambourine ceases, the noise of the jubilant ends, the joy of the harp ceases. They shall not drink wine with a song, strong drink is bitter to those who drink it. The city of confusion is broken down, every house is shut up so that none may go in. There is a cry for wine in the streets, all joy is darkened, the mirth of the land is gone. In the city, desolation is left, and the gate is stricken with destruction. When it shall be thus in the midst of the land among the people, it shall be like the shaking of an olive tree, like the gleaning of grapes when the vintage is done. Isaiah chapter 24, verses 1 through 13.
you know, it's possible for you to misunderstand Isaiah and to take him all out of context. I'm looking at today's reading and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what in the world? Listen carefully. It says in verse one, behold, the Lord will empty the earth. He will empty the earth and make it desolate. And he will twist its surface and scatter its inhabitants. Wow. What kind of, what in the world is this? What is God saying? And if you take that verse and you misinterpret it, take it out of context, it's going to be a problem because you're going to be saying, well, God is an evil God and he's trying to do all this, but God is not evil. God is good. You have to keep reading to understand it. But today we're going to explore the punishment that God inflicts on people for not believing or trusting him. And that's important. Everyone has a chance, but the people who choose not to have to bear the cost of their choice. Very interesting. If you have your Bible guide, turn to today's page. If not, then you can write to us and get a hold of a Bible guide. If you send an offering in any amount, we very much appreciate that, especially now as it helps us with our electricity and everything to pay for this, but it keeps us going to prisoners and to different people that we're ministering to. And it's very important that you understand that. So thank you so much for doing that. Now, ways of truth, that's the way that God's truth comes to us. God makes himself speak to us in such a way that we understand its ways of truth. Now, the only way to truly say this is the cost of sin. The cost, God's going to empty the earth because of the cost of sin. I want you to think about this because it's important that God cannot tolerate sin as a holy God. He did something about sin if we would just get with his program, but sin cannot exist in heaven, cannot exist. God is bringing heaven to earth. That's what's happening. So this is the cost of sin we're reading about today. We read Isaiah 22 to 24. I want to encourage you uh, to read through the Bible with us. Very important. We are looking at Isaiah 24, 1 to 13. And Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would speak this word to us, that we would hear it today and understand it in the name of Jesus Christ. And we said together, amen. Now, again, let's look at the first verse and let's try to understand this because it says it differently in the New King James Version, still right, but listen carefully. Behold, or take note, the Lord makes the earth empty. He makes it a waste. He distorts its surface and scatters abroad its inhabitants. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, listen carefully, as with the servant, so with his master, as with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the creditor, so with the debtor. The land shall be entirely emptied and utterly plundered, for the Lord has spoken his word. Now, nobody gets out of this. You can't buy your way out of it or talent your way. Nobody gets out. God speaks to everyone. E-V-E-R-Y-O-N-E. -E, everyone, everywhere about sin. No one can escape it unless he is already Lord of our life. Sin has been dealt with by Jesus Christ, and we must ask the Lord to come into our life and redeem us, redeem us from sin. That's called repenting. You repent, and then you become redeemed. God gives the price of Jesus Christ for you. So when he looks at you, he no longer sees the sin, but he sees the work of Jesus Christ who's in you. That's what God sees. That is the message of salvation. That is what makes a Christian a true Christian, not political, not cultural. It's the redemption of Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's what it is. We need to think that through. Now we go back to the scripture. The earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth languish. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants because they transgressed the laws. They transgressed the laws, changed the ordinances, broken the everlasting covenant. Three things that God says there are very important. Changed 
the ordinances, broke the law, transgressed the laws, changed the covenant, or changed the ordinances, and broke the everlasting covenant. Therefore, the curse has devoured the earth, and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. Beloved, what does that mean? It means this. Man's future without God is dismal. It's going to die. God tells us what will happen. Right here. Right here. 2,000 years old. Well, more than that, because 2,700 years old. Been there all this time. We didn't pay attention to it because it wasn't exciting or... Keep in mind, beloved, that God speaks to us. He's telling us the future. In fact, listen to verse 7. The new wine fails. The vine languishes. All of the merry-hearted sigh. The myrrh of the tambourine ceases. The noise of the jubilant ends. And the joy of the harp ceases. They shall not drink wine with a song. Strong drink is bitter to those who drink it. The city of confusion is broken down. Every house is shut up so that none may go in. There is a cry for wine in the streets. All joy is darkened. The myrrh of the land is gone. In the city, desolation is left. And the gate is stricken with destruction. When it shall be thus in the midst of the land among the people. It shall be like the shaking of an olive tree like the gleaning of grapes when the vintage is done. God gives us that example. Happiness fades into nothing in the future. What is your future like? Is your future great? You're going to do this, you're going to do that. You're not going to do anything without God. Because everybody's future is dismal. Everybody's future is ending. You say, Rod, you're not being very positive. You're... No, I'm being truthful. But if you invite Jesus Christ into your heart, into your life, if you say, Lord Jesus, I need you into my heart, he redeems you. And now your future is excellent. Praise the Lord. Very simple, beloved. We look at the Bible and we see that God tells us this. God speaks to us through his grace. We need to understand, Lord, my future is nothing without you. I confess to you. I'm telling you, Rod Embry's telling you, my future is nothing without God. But with God... My future is everything. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You say that's Christianese. I don't care. Praise the Lord is a good word. You know, God is always faithful. God is always true. And this is important. There's nothing that goes against who God is. Now, we'll talk about that next time on Quick Study Television as we deal with the reasons for life. Ryan? Well, in yesterday's program, we began our two-part study on the Minoans. Now, though these people belong to one of the world's most ancient of cultures, their technology was way ahead of its time, thousands of years ahead. Now, yesterday we looked at the great palace of Canossus, and today we look at a smaller artifact which has been dubbed the Phaestus Disc. Let's study. Since excavations first began back in 1899, many startling discoveries have been made on the Mediterranean island of Crete. Indeed, though Crete was once home to the Minoans, an ancient civilization dating to between 2150 and 1450 BC, many of their technological innovations were way ahead of their time. 
For example, the Minoans were master builders, and their very large palaces often contained technological features which rivaled that of the Romans some 1400 to 2000 years later. Some of these features included running water, drainage systems, toilets, and baths. Also found among these ruins were various high-quality artifacts made of elements such as rock crystal, ivory, gold, and clay, which clearly display the wealth, craftsmanship, and artistry of the Minoans. One of the most mysterious of these relics was discovered among some pottery at the Minoan Palace of Phaistus in Crete in the early 1900s. Dubbed the Phaistus Disc, it is a small circular clay disc, roughly 16 and a half centimeters across and one centimeter thick, that has been impressed on both sides with pictograms and symbols resembling hieroglyphics. This artifact is quite unique because unlike other Minoan clay tablets, which were left unbaked, this disc was deliberately fired, which gave permanency to the symbols contained on it. Also interesting is that these mysterious and indecipherable symbols are arranged in a line that spirals in clockwise from the outer edge of the disc to the center, or perhaps the other way round. And although there are 241 characters on the disc, many are repeated, so that only 45 different glyphs or symbols are present. Yet the most remarkable feature of the Physis disc is the fact that the various signs are identical each time they occur. This means that these symbols were not carved by hand. Rather, stamps carved from wood or cast in metal must have been used to print the symbols into the clay, which would make this the world's earliest example of movable type. Indeed, the Phaistus disc is dated to approximately 1700 BC, and if correct, then the Minoans were 2500 years ahead of the Chinese, who reinvented movable type in the 9th century AD. The Minoan civilization is very much out of place within evolutionary history. Such an ancient culture could not have been evolved enough to accomplish such great technological feats. Ancient peoples such as these are a reminder that mankind indeed was created fully formed and intelligent from the beginning, just as the Bible proclaims. As we study these ancient relics from the past, it quickly becomes obvious that ancient peoples were in fact intelligent. Now, though evolutionists would have us believe otherwise, the facts remain. And significantly, while the facts greatly confront evolutionary history and cause great mystery and controversy, they actually strongly confirm biblical history. Man was created fully human and, and intelligent from the beginning. With this proper understanding, these out-of-place artifacts aren't out of place at all, nor do they create great mystery or controversy. You know, Ryan, it's interesting because the, the out-of-place artifacts um, are really not out of place. Not for the biblical worldview. Well, not for biblical, no. Yeah. In fact, what's out of place is a worldview that has a longer timeline. Uh, because, you know, we look at the evidence, and the evidence is pointing to a shorter timeline. Mm -hmm. And I read the other day they had to shorten the length of uh, something from 100 million years. They shortened yeah. it down to uh, 10 million years. So mm -hmm. that's a 90% 90 90 shorten yeah. of what in the world is happening. You know, you, you cut it down that much, but it's not a problem because they have to adjust their time. But they never actually come to the place where they recognize the biblical timeline. Uh, it, it's the history of man. It's an artificial history, mm. evolution. And it's meant to replace God. That's why I fully reject any form of evolution, any form of that, because that's where it stems from, to replace God. And my authority, I, I stand on the word of God. And, and I don't and, apologize for that. And in that authority, I mean, you, you, you know, you, you come to the place where you're we're getting, and again, we're not saying that, you know, you're not a Christian if you believe in evolution, but we're saying that biblical authority is important. Absolutely. And, you know, Adam and Eve were not allegories. And they were real people. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I'll tell you one thing that I think of often is that I've thought of it several times, that imagine what Adam could see if he could see the rest of the earth, what happened with all the sin. And I thought about that because somebody was asking me, well, does my father look down? Does my mother look down and see us? And, and I began to think that through and pray through. And I thought, well... I'm not sure that in the context of heaven that that would be a good thing, that God may be kept back so that they wouldn't see the difficulty that some people have. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, it's very interesting. Yeah. Very good. 
good mm -hmm. work. Well, if you are enjoying Ryan's Out of Place Artifact segments, then I would encourage you, uh, we have this uh, DVD available. Uh, it is 15 Out of Place Artifacts. It's a DVD done by Ryan last year. So if you've been following through the Bible with us, you may have this already or you may have seen us offer it. Uh, but it is a collection of 15 Out of Place Artifacts done by Ryan. So if you would like to get this DVD, get a hold of us and it's for a suggested donation of $25 or more. Our other product that we are highlighting this month is of course the introduction to Isaiah. And that's because we are reading through the book of Isaiah on Quick Study right now. Uh, so this just gives you a lot of historical and background information on the prophet Isaiah and what was going on uh, during his lifetime here on earth. Uh, so if you would like to get a hold of this, then again, get a hold of us. And it also is for a suggested donation of $25 or more. So that these are just some products that we think might aid you in your, in your study of the Bible this month. Excellent. Very good. <laughs> Janice? Yes. Well, we read Isaiah chapter 24 and there is impending judgment on the earth. And we see this uh, striking way of, of talking about all humans, um, inhabitants of the earth will be judged in a, in a way that they're showing the opposites. Here's what I mean. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts its surface and scatters abroad its inhabitants. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with his master, as with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the creditor, so with the debtor. The land shall be entire, entirely emptied and utterly plundered, for the Lord has spoken this word. This, this comparison of opposites shows that there is no social standing to this judgment at all. What has caused this judgment to come upon the earth is human sin. Yeah. And we've been talking about that. that. It's that human sin that has entered into us. There is not one human being except for Jesus Christ who has been on the earth that has been absolutely sinless. We are all born into sin, but God has made a way for us to separate us from that sin. That doesn't mean that we're perfect by any stretch of the imagination. And those of us who follow Jesus Christ know that to be true. We're not perfect. But when God looks at us after we have accepted Jesus Christ into our life, he no longer sees that sin in us. He sees the work of Jesus Christ done on the cross um, and in his resurrection from the, de from, from the dead. And so that's, we don't have to be a part of that judgment. No. God has made a way for us not to be in that judgment. And it has nothing to do with social or economic values, whether we're from a third world country or whether we're not. It, it has no bearing. In God's eyes, we're all the same. In fact, we're we are. We're all the same. And we all have that same opportunity to make a decision for God or against God. And that's a free will decision that we have. So the question is, what decision will mm -hmm. the people make? Um, and that's why we're here, go into the world and preach the good news. Absolutely. That's what the good news is, that Jesus Christ did something for sin. And the question I have for you is very simple. Who is Jesus? You've got to deal with that. He rose from the dead. Who is he?